the Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Dunn. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will please call the roll. Chairperson Carlin. I'm sorry? Chairperson Carlin. <laughs> Here. Vice Chair Edwards. Here. Board Member Heed. Here. Board Member Finn. Here. Board Member Ben Faulkner. Here. Board Member Patana. Here. Board Member Hunt. Here. Board Member Dunn. Here. And Board Member Johnson. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of May 4th, 2021. Uh, we continue measures to ensure the health and safety of our residents while assuring that the actions of your city council remain transparent. This plexiglass is one of the many changes that have been put into place amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Within the council chambers, masks are required and capacity is limited. The barriers you see between us allow us to conduct council business without a mask while controlling the possibility of transmission. For additional in-person and remote viewing and speaking measures, please consult the City of Peoria website. We will now begin with a series of Community Facilities District Board meetings. Per Arizona state law, our board now consists of the City Council as well as two additional board members. Jerry Johnson and Mike Heath have joined us at the dais for specific CFD board meetings. And we thank you both for volunteering. So we will begin this evening with the Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights Community Facilities District Board Meeting. The first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Board members, are there any items to be removed from consent or any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote on the consent agenda. And it passes unanimously. We will now move on to new business for the Mystic CFD. Item 2R is proposed fiscal year 2022 budget and tax levy for Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights Community Facilities District. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, representing the district is our district chief financial officer, Sonia Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, and good afternoon, um, Chairperson Carlett and members of the board. Item 2R is the resolution to adopt the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget and tax levy and also set the public hearing date for the Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights CFD. The Lake Pleasant Heights, Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights CFD was formed in 2020 for the purpose of financing El Mirage Road and other major road and water wastewater infrastructure. 
The fiscal year 2022 proposed budget totals $437,500, and the proposed tax rate is $265 per $100 of tax assessed value. And the proposed budget will be published in the Peoria Times as required by state statutes on May 6th and May 11th, and the public hearing date and final adoption of the budget is set for May 18th. And with that, I can answer any questions. Thank you. Board, are there any questions for Ms. Anders? Okay, then do I have a motion on item 2R? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second, please vote. And it passes unanimously. All right, we are now moving on to the Vistancia North Community Facilities District Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, board, are there any um, items to be removed from consent or is there any discussion on consent? Not seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion is second, please vote. And it passes unanimously. All right, so now we have new business for VNCFD, proposed fiscal year 2022 budget and tax levy for Vistancia North Community Facilities District. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, and Ms. Anders will also represent the Vistancia North Community Facilities District. Thank you. Um, item 4R is the resolution to adopt the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget and tax levy for the Vistancia North CFD. The Vistancia North CFD was also formed in 2020 for the purpose of financing the Joe Max treatment plant and other major water and wastewater infrastructure. The proposed fiscal year 2022 budget totals 354,500 and the proposed tax rate for the Vistancia North CFD is 55 cents. Um, like the Mystic CFD, the proposed budget will be published in the Peoria Times and the public hearing and final adoption is set for May 18th. Thank you. Uh, board, are there any questions for Ms. Anders? So it is, there is actually two tax rates here. Yes. The original one that all of Estancia has and then the secondary one, which is 55 cents. Yes, Chairman Carla and members of the board, the Vistancia North CFD is an overlay on top of the existing Vistancia CFD. The existing Vistancia CFD has a 210 tax rate, and with this Vistancia North CFD, it will be 265 in total. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, uh, board, is there any, if there's no further discussion, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank you to board members Johnson and Heath. We appreciate your, your work on these two CFDs. And now we will have a change to our dais. So these two wonderful volunteers will be leaving us. And after the uh, stations are cleaned, <laughs> we will um, have our youth council liaisons come back and join us. So if the clerk would please make note of that change, I would appreciate it. So now we will move on to the Vistancia Community Facilities District Board meeting. And the first item is the consent agenda. Board members, any discussion or removal of anything from consent? Seeing none, would you please vote? And that passes unanimously. We will now move to new business. Item 6R is proposed fiscal year 2022 budget and tax levy for Vistancia Community Facilities District. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, and Ms. Sanders also serves as District Chief Financial Officer for Vistancia, so helpful presentation is coming. 
Thank you, Mr. Tyne, Chairman Carlett, and members of the board. This item is the proposed fiscal 20 year 2022 budget and tax levy for the Vistancia CFD. The Vistancia CFD was formed in 2002. This is our oldest CFD for the purpose of financing the Jomax treatment plant and other major water and wastewater infrastructure. The fiscal year 2022 proposed budget totals $4,692,500 and the proposed tax rate remains unchanged at $2.10. And like the other two CFDs, it will be, the proposed budget will be published in the Peoria Times and the public hearing and final adoption of the budget is set for May 18th. Thank you. Uh, board, are there any questions, discussion? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second, please vote. And that passes unanimously. Okay, we have one more. This is the Vistancia West Community Facilities District Board meeting. And the first item is the consent agenda. Board members, are there anything to be, is there anything to be removed from consent? Or is there any discussion? Seeing none, could I have a motion please? Move to approve. Second. Right, please vote. And that passes unanimously. And now new business for Vistancia West, and that is proposed fiscal year 2022 budget and tax levy for Vistancia West Community Facilities District. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Ms. Sanders will uh, deliver a presentation for this fourth and final community facilities district. Thank you. So this is the proposed budget and tax levy for Vistancia West. Vistancia West was formed in 2014 for the purpose of financing the realignment for Dysart Road sewer and other major water and wastewater infrastructure. The fiscal year 2022 proposed budget totals 937,500 and the proposed tax rate is unchanged at $2.10. And the last slide is the same with the other CFDs. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Any questions? All right, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second, please vote. And item 8R passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. We will now move on to City of Peoria consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the city council and will be enacted by one motion unless a council member requests an item to be removed and considered in the normal sequence on the agenda. Council, are there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion? A motion. motion a second, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. Now move on to regular agenda and new business. Item 18R, adoption and tentative budget for fiscal year 2022. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And after uh, nearly a year worth of uh, reviewing uh, all of our operations and projects that we have, uh, we are now at a step for the formal adoption of the budget. And one of those steps is the tentative budget and to present on this we have Peter Christensen our budget manager. Thank you Mr. Tyne. Good evening Mayor and Council. Tonight is the first in a series of formal steps to adopt a budget for fiscal year 2022. Um, of hard work to put the budget together that included a number of briefings at the City Council including on things like the economy, the city's financial condition and um, also several of our major functions and services of the city. State law requires that we adopt a tentative budget before we adopt, before you adopt a final budget. And that's what we're here to do tonight. This tentative budget sets the maximum appropriation for the coming year, meaning that once adopted, we cannot exceed the amount of the tentative budget um, during the year. On March 31st at the study session, I gave a financial overview of the FY22 budget and the department and the deputy city managers provided an overview of some of the, de of the department budgets. Um, I'm not gonna go through all that again tonight, 
but I do want to hit on some key points and, of course, a few numbers since this is the budget. Um, so first of all, the, the budget as proposed is a balanced budget. It's balanced not just for the coming fiscal year, but also over our five-year forecast period, meaning that ongoing revenues are sufficient to support ongoing expenditures. And as such, we feel that we are in a strong uh, financial position and continue to be so. Um, the City of Peoria prides itself on providing exceptional public services, and this budget provides the resources necessary for departments to continue to meet the expectations of our citizens and businesses. The budget supports the most uh, your most important priorities as uh, articulated in the uh, livability initiatives. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we continue to live within our means. This budget does not propose any tax increases, and although it doesn't include a modest utility rate adjustment, Peoria does continue to enjoy some of the, one of the lowest tax and fee uh, burdens in the Valley. So the tentative budget as proposed totals $695 million. This is a 4.5% increase over fiscal year 2021. It's made up of the four categories you see on the screen. The largest one, of course, is the operating budget, which totals uh, $329 million and is, about, is almost half of the total. The next largest category is the capital budget, which for the first year of the 10-year CIP is $242 million. And then we have our debt service and contingency categories. And that contingency, um, as we always like to remind you, is not for any particular purpose other than to give us flexibility to be able to use our fund balance reserves in the event of an emergency or uh, perhaps an unexpected opportunity. So tonight we're asking council to adopt the tentative budget for fiscal year 2022. Uh, we will be, be back on May 18th for the next steps, which include public hearings on truth and taxation, the property tax levy and the final budget. And that's also the night um, that we'll ask you to adopt the final budget and the utility rates. And then we'll be back on June 1st for the final property tax levy. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the, the tentative budget as proposed. Thank you. Council, are there any questions or discussion? Okay, so we, we will come back um, at another council meeting and talk about the budget when we finally adopt it at the next meeting. Tonight, we are approving the cap. So we cannot add some things in here to make this budget go over what we're approving tonight, correct? Exactly. And we will be doing the same for the capital improvement plan after that. Okay, uh, do I have a motion? Motion to accept. Second. We have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. And it passes unanimously, thank you. All right, so we will now move on to the capital improvement program for fiscal years 2022 through 2031. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor uh, and Council. As part of our uh, principles of sound financial management, as you know, the city really tries to incorporate a long-range perspective when we look at our financial outlook. And the 10-year capital improvement plan is an example of that. Uh, the 10-year plan that you will be reviewing tonight and that you've discussed over the last months is not only a listing of planned improvements, but also identifies all associated funding sources with that. So this is indeed a 10-year balanced plan, as Mr. Christensen will also speak to, totaling over $835 million. So with that, I'll pass it to our budget manager, Mr. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, Mayor and Council members. The, uh, as Jeff mentioned, the Council adopted principles of sound financial management actually do require us to prepare each year a financially balanced and multi-year capital improvement program. And that's what we're here tonight um, for your consideration and adoption. Um, the 10-year CIP totals $835.6 million. This is a six per, or a, almost a 7% increase over last year's 10-year program. Um, as you look at this chart, you'll notice that uh, investments in water and wastewater infrastructure make up almost a half of this 10-year of this program. This is more than it's been in the past, um, primarily because of some sizable expansions of various plants, including Pyramid Peak, uh, Beardsley, and Jomax over the 10-year period. 
um, building and maintaining an efficient roadway network is a critical function of the city and this always makes up a sizable share of the capital program. This year is no different. As you see, streets and traffic make up almost a quarter of the program. Some of the notable projects, notable near-term projects in the streets and traffic area include um, the Olive Avenue safety improvements, the, a new signal at 85th and Olive Avenues, the widening of 67th Avenue from Pinnacle Peak to Happy Valley, and the Joe Max connection from Vistantia Boulevard over to the Loop 303. The other big um, category here is our parks category, which includes community parks, neighborhood parks, our trail system, as well as any investments we make in the Peoria Sports Complex. This category totals 17%, and some of the near-term projects of note are a new trailhead at 99th and Olive Avenues, various trail connections around the city, and phase two of Paloma Community Park. The other categories include drainage, economic development, operational facilities, and public safety, and combined, these categories make up about 14% of the total. Moving on to the revenue side of the equation. Um, if you look at this pie chart on the left-hand side is what we call um, our pay-as-you-go sources. These are one-time um, cash outlays from our various fund balances. They include things like our water and wastewater utilities, transportation sales tax, our HERF um, distributions from the state, as uh, general fund and half-cent uh, funds. So a number of just fund balance, one-time fund balances we've built up over time for the purpose of investing in capital. On the lower right-hand side, we have what we call our pay-as-you-use sources. This is the debt categories. Uh, general obligation bonds are secured by, as you know, our secondary property tax. And then revenue bonds are primarily secured by water and wastewater revenues. Then we have our impact fees at 13% of the total, which help with our growth-related projects. So tonight we're asking you to approve the 10-year CIP for fiscal years 2022 through 2031. Um, we'll be back on the May 18th to approve the first year of the capital program as part of the final budget. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Council, are there any questions on the um, capital improvement plan? No? All right. So I do just want to say thank you. I know that I'm doing it a little bit in advance, but thank you for all of the work that you all put in on the budget, balancing our budget, and then balancing our 10-year capital improvement program. Uh, you know, it's not easy to make sure that we have funding sources for the next 10 years for anything, let alone an entire um, program, but you guys do it every year, and I just thoroughly appreciate that we can count on that. So thank you for all of the work. Thank you for making sure that we are putting a lot of um, our funds and our attention into water and wastewater, which are just critical in this time of drought and this time of very expensive uh, purchases of water for us to have it in our city and to store it for the future. So thank you for making sure that we're all covered. And with that, do I have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, we will now move on to item 20R, which is project update, mobile food vendor text amendment. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, and we have Chris Hawkes, our planning and community development director to speak on this informational item. Great, thank you, Mr. Tyne, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, item 20R, this is a uh, project update for a zoning code amendment that we're working on uh, pertaining to mobile food vendors, or as we otherwise know them as food, uh, food trucks. Um, this is an, an item that we're providing to the Council for an advanced preview. It's expected to come back to Council in June. So we're here tonight to give you some information, answer any questions, and uh, we expect to be back in June, as I mentioned. Um, so, so tonight, as, as uh, Mr. Tyne mentioned, this is a no-action preview on it. Uh, this amendment was initiated by the city. Um, as you know, food trucks have become increasingly popular and now they're regularly part of our, our community landscape. 
The primary purpose of this amendment is to bring our code and practices into compliance with new legislation that was passed, uh, known as HB 2371, or otherwise the Food Truck Freedom Bill. Uh, the secondarily, the regulatory, the regulatory structure that we have in place today doesn't really align well with the practices of the industry. So uh, we're trying to introduce an ordinance that is nearly tailored to deal with the, the impacts and also protect the community and, uh, and deal with the realities of the, of the food truck industry. In developing the amendment, we've uh, sought input from a variety of sources. Um, we've been uh, meeting with and getting input from the City Council Subcommittee on Codes. Uh, we've also held a uh, stakeholder uh, review meeting, which we had input from food truck representatives, um, the chamber, and other sources. We've also held two study sessions in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And uh, as I mentioned, next month we'll, we'll see you back. OK, a little bit about the new regulatory landscape. Uh, House Bill 2371, the Food Truck Freedom Bill, this was passed in 2018. It's now uh, codified in the state statute. Uh, the bill established new uh, statewide licensing, inspection, and safety standards for food trucks. Um, those requirements are administered by the Arizona Department of Health Services and the county health departments. Um, secondarily, the bill also asserted uniform standards across the state. So it was recognized that food truck operations extend across jurisdictional boundaries, and what they found is that there was really disparate requirements across boundaries. So there was an effort to have a uniform framework, but also provide the ability for local jurisdictions to have some uh, um, local discretion in the matter. The bill defined new terms like mobile food unit and mobile food vendor, which we have proposed for adoption into our code. I think some of the key aspects of that is that a mobile food unit is a readily movable uh, uh, source. It's not a, a uh, vehicle that is fixed at a site all day long. It also dispenses uh, food and beverage for immediate service and consumption. In this endeavor, the, uh, we rece they received input from the, Nash the, I should rather say, the League of Cities, Arizona Cities and Towns, uh, developed a model ordinance. And in that model ordinance, they received uh, input from the National Food Truck Association, the National League of Cities, and met with local food vendors. So in putting together our proposed draft, we also did include many of those recommendations from the model ordinance. Okay, so portions of the bill that were of particular interest to cities are the provisions that, as I mentioned, standardize the local regulation of food truck operations. So I'll indicate what a city can do and what we cannot do in putting together our ordinance. Um, we certainly have the discretion to prohibit uh, food truck operations within 250 feet of a residential zoning district. Uh, we can also prohibit operations if a site has a particularly, it's insufficient in, in terms of parking as our code would require it. We can also restrict the duration. Duration means the amount of time a food truck is on a site. So we do have the ability to restrict that time period and we can restrict the vehicle size, the, the extent of that on the site. What we cannot do is we cannot require special permits that are not required of other types of mobile vendors. So we have to treat all mobile vendors the same. We also cannot uh, require a additional separation or setbacks from restaurants and businesses. So we can't say that a food truck has to be at least 500 feet from a restaurant. So that's something that is uh, uniformly prohibited in this bill. We can, of course, institute our fire building and safety codes. Um, we can also not restrict the use of a legal parking space. So if a site has um, sufficient parking, and most sites have a surplus of parking, then the, we, we cannot restrict the use of that space. And then the fourth and final bullet point is that um, if a food truck has got a uh, passing inspection in another community within the last 12 months, we have to honor that inspection. We can't require an additional uh, fire inspection. So I mentioned earlier, the uh, current regulations that we have in the code don't really deal very well with food trucks. They predate House Bill 2371. So uh, currently, all temporary outdoor sales and events require a temporary use permit. So um, examples of temporary use permit includes things like carnivals, uh, Christmas tree sales, pumpkin lots, firework sales, and we do include food trucks currently uh, within, that, uh, within that period. Temporary use permits only pertain to private property. So events like the 4th of July event at the sports complex, that's not part of temporary use permit process. That's a special event license that they would get through the city uh, parks department. And any um, operations on city right away, that's separate and not part of this, this amendment. This only deals with private property. So there are some limitations through the temporary use permit. Um, currently, a site can only have, there can only be a, a maximum of 30 days for each temporary use permit and then a site can renew it three times per year. So 
over a period of, of a year, one site could have a temporary use permit for a third of that year, 120 days. As you know, food trucks operate and function very differently. Often they're at a site for a discrete period of time and they move and they might want to be at the site every day for the, for the period of year. So our temporary use permit structure doesn't really align very well with the practices of the industry. In developing the draft, uh, we did a scan of local and national regulations and I think what we found is that um, cities are, have a lot of different requirements, right? Maybe some of the cities have just not updated their codes yet, but there's just a lot of different uh, approaches to food trucks. Um, we also, as I mentioned, consulted with the, the, legal, the league model ordinance and had some very good suggestions in there. Uh, we met with the council subcommittee on codes uh, several times, held a stakeholder meeting as I mentioned, and also got very good input from the, st from the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission through the study sessions. So our objective in this amendment, we want to narrowly tailor the, the ordinance to address the practices and, and really provide a true balance between um, you know, ensuring that food trucks behave like food trucks, meaning that they're at a site for a, a uh, short period of time and they move on to other sites, they're not, they're not there fixed all day long. And we want to make sure that as we provide these requirements that they certainly um, um, ensure the interest of the community in that regard. Okay, so some of the highlights of the amendment, and, and again, this amendment is uh, still under consideration by the Planning and Zoning Commission, but the way we had structured this is if the food truck can, can meet all the performance standards, they would not be required to get a temporary use permit. Um, they would requ still, of course, be required to get a business license but in a sense, we are recognizing the food truck as an accessory use, uh, provided it behaves like a mobile vendor, and we've structured the performance standard to ensure that it uh, operates like a mobile vendor and is not a fixed site. Um, so a food truck operator would have to get permission from the owner or the authorized agent on a site. Um, the input that we've received and we have put in the draft was that there, there should be a setback of 250 feet from single family residential zone lots because sometimes with the food truck there, are, there might be music and lights. We want to make sure that we have adequate separation between those uses. We also want to ensure that the site doesn't fall below minimum parking requirements. Our code will require a certain minimum number of stalls based on the use on the site. We want to make sure that if a food truck operates on a site, there's a surplus of parking and they're not causing that site to fall below standards. It's got to be on a dustproof surface and as you would imagine, it cannot block uh, pedestrian and vehicular circulation, fire lanes and those, those sorts. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure they, they behave like a food truck. The, um, the League of Cities ordinance had uh, recommended a six hour duration. The input we've received uh, recommended an eight hour duration which provides adequate time for the food truck to operate, also provides time to set up and to take down. So we thought that was a reasonable period of time. And also hours of operation are limited as well. They, they could not occur past a certain uh, time in the evening unless it was an auxiliary operation for a, a bar or tavern, essentially an, an extra kitchen for that, for that uh, use. And then while um, the county health department does require a food truck to have access to a bathroom um, if they're there longer than an hour. Um, so that's really taken care of by the, by the county health department. Our ordinance prohibits mobile restrooms. Again, they, they are visually and seemingly on a site. And so the objective would be that the, if the food truck's there for a longer period of time, that they make those arrangements with the site they're on or a site that's in proximity for, for use of the bathroom. So. Um, in a nutshell, these are the highlights of the amendment. Um, as I mentioned, we are, our next stop is with the Planning and Zoning Commission for their uh, recommendation and consideration, and then back in front of the City Council in June. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments, and that's all I have. Council, are there any questions? Council Member Dunn? So the food truck doesn't uh, need, you know, the temporary use permit, correct? Mayor Carlott, uh, Councilmember Redund, it would not if it followed the performance standard. If a food truck intended to be there all day or as part of a carnival or a special event, they would need a temporary use permit or that event would need a temporary use permit. So if, if they don't need one and we're assuming that they have permission to park on a site, you know, let's say a big parking lot with several stores, we, we probably assume that they have the authorized permissions. What's the oversight over that? And wh what do we do to make sure that, you know, this doesn't, because I, I do see trucks in, in, even in my district mm -hmm. and, and I've got complaints that they don't have permission. So what's the oversight over that? How can we regulate that? 
Mayor, Councilmember Dunn, um, this ordinance sets up the performance standards and, uh, and really what this is is complaint driven. So the ex to the extent it is noticed that a food truck is operating outside of these parameters or we get complaints and we, we then go investigate it, we have the ordinance in place that we can then, then we can seek action on that matter as a code matter. So would that be like in the form of a fine or? Uh... Um, Mayor, Councilmember Dunn, so the, the code and enforcement uh, uh, department, what they would do is they would, um, they have a, a, a practice in which they provide an advisory to the food truck me uh, member to, you know, here are the requirements for the, for the food truck ordinance um, and basically give them an opportunity to cure that and come into compliance. And they have a, they have a process by which they go through which provides notification and so forth. But to, seek, but to seek change so that they're not violating that. But oftentimes what it is is providing information the food truck operator may just not be aware of that and so providing that information so that they're aware and they operate within the parameters of the ordinance. Would we keep any like records of if we had like people that offended often? Um, Mayor, Councilmember Redunn, um, I, I believe the uh, Code Enforcement Division, they keep regular records of interactions uh, based on complaints. So they'll get a complaint, they'll investigate that complaint, and they'll insert notes into how that complaint was handled if there was compliance. Thank you, sir. Yep. Anyone else? Um, Chris, in a couple of those photos, I saw seating outside of the truck. Is there any rules or regulations with regards to the seating? that they bring or take or use permanently? Mayor and Council, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, uh, food trucks can have seating out there. Now there are some provisos, right? The, the, the seating, of course, um, can't, uh, you know, can't impact or, or disrupt any of those drive aisles or safety areas that I talked about. Can't, uh, you know, you have to have adequate parking and so forth. But if the food truck is there longer than an hour, the state requires that they have restroom facilities. So at that point, you know, they have to not only get a license through the state, but they have to demonstrate that they have access to restroom facilities. Seating, um, I meant uh, like outdoor tables. Yes, I'm sorry, man. Yes, you, you could have seating out Thinking there. You of a different kind of seating, aren't you? <laughs> right, no, I meant that, I assume with seating, then the food truck would be there longer than an hour. And, um, but the short answer is, Yes, a food truck could have seating out there. Um, they, of course, have to make sure that they observe all those safety requirements and parameters that we have. Okay. All right. Well, so this item is for information and discussion only. And if there's no further questions, then we will have to see you next time. All righty. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. All right, next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items, and we have received no speaker request forms. So we will now move on to reports from city manager. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. No formal presentations tonight. Just a, a reminder that uh, at our next council meeting on May 18th, we plan a study session to review regional efforts that are being done by a number of jurisdictions uh, to develop a countywide transportation plan and to discuss potential revenue sources being considered. So we'll have a, a thoughtful study session on that item before. But other than that, uh, no other comments at this time. Thank you. We so look forward to that conversation. <laughs> All right, we will now move on to reports from our youth council liaisons who will be with us this council meeting and just one more after this. Wow, time passes quickly, doesn't it? So. Um, why don't we start in your direction, Mr. Van Winkle. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, and on behalf of the City of Peoria Youth Advisory Board as one of the Council Youth Liaisons and also just a fellow citizen, um, I'd like to formally welcome all new members and returning members to the Youth Advisory Board for this um, next 2021 through 2022 school year that has been approved as part of today's consent agenda. Um, your drive to serve is what's going to keep us moving forward. And I'm just so excited to get to know you guys and to work closely with you and to show you what the city has to offer. Um, and so I just want to thank you. Um, that'll be all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Ms. Tawari. Uh, Mayor and council members, I'm also very excited to meet the new uh, recruits to the Youth Advisory Board. but. Um, our community service committee on the Youth Advisory Board is currently planning a teen mental health webinar coming up this month or earlier next month. Um, so that's going to be one of our first webinars as a Youth Advisory Board. So we're really excited for that and no other reports from me. Thank you. 
Thank you. We appreciate the work that you guys do. We will certainly miss you when you're gone. All right, and with that, seeing no further business, we are adjourned.